All right, good morning, good evening, good night, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, welcome to our final uh, webinar series entitled Shaping the Future of Self-Care Through Pharmacy. Um, we are here today to discuss health and self-literacy for the management of minor ailments in pharmacy, and we're going to focus on reflux management, specifically heartburn and indigestion. I'm Amy Howard. I uh, am a clinical professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. I work primarily in pediatrics and do happen to work in both the health literacy sphere and in pediatric gastroenterology as my ambulatory care practice. So hopefully we can get some great insights today. Um, but that's about me. I'll be your moderator. Important housekeeping announcements for today. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube. Uh, the recording will be made available on the website, events.fip.org. You can ask questions using the Q&A box provided, so we will not be fielding questions through the, the chat. Feel free to discuss amongst your colleagues within the chat, but if you'd like to ask the panelists any questions, please use that Q&A function. We'll be watching it throughout the presentations, and the presenters have been told that they can respond either by typing in answers or providing questions during the Q&A section of this discussion. You are welcome to provide any feedback about the webinars. There is an email that you can link to their webinars at FIP.org. And if you'd like to become a member of FIP, please be sure to visit the website listed there at FIP.org slash membership underscore registration. This webinar is sponsored through unconditional funding by Reckitt. So the goal for today is <clears throat> shaping the future of self-care through pharmacy. This is a series about empowering patient self-care to improve health outcomes and reduce the burden of disease by improving and improving health and self-care literacy. It's therefore important and a key to empowering uh, pharmacy-based self-care. This is especially important when it comes to the management of minor ailments through uh, the work in pharmacy, Consisting of a series of five events focusing on common health issues, this FIP digital program aims to examine how pharmacists can be enabled to empower health and self-literacy, approaching five different areas in minor ailments, discussing the embedded content of health and self-literacy in education and training, development of self-diagnoses and self-medication protocols, widening access to patient information and improving referral strategies. Today's event is the last in our series, as I mentioned, and will focus on reflux management, particularly due to heartburn and indigestion. Pharmacists hold a vital position in enhancing health and self-care literacy for the management of these minor ailments. Health literacy can empower individuals to take an active role in managing their health, their reflux uh, by understanding the condition, recognizing the symptoms, making lifestyle changes, knowing what the available treatment options are, and communicating effectively with healthcare providers. Today, the event aims for participants to understand the clinical aspects and health literacy needs with regard to reflux management heartburn and indigestion, identify strategies for pharmacists to enable health and self-care literacy in reflux management, heartburn and indigestion, discuss enablers across education and training, care protocols and services, and access to patient information and referral strategies. All right, so I will quickly introduce the speakers before I turn over to each of them. Today, we have panelists, Professor Holly Hungen, uh, Brett McFarland, and also Michael uh, Boyvin and Ruben Vegas. Our first speaker up is Professor Paul Hungen. He's based in Northeast England, is an emeritus professor of primary care and general practice at Newcastle University in the United Kingdom. He has over 25 years of experience as a general practitioner 
and has also worked as a hospital practitioner in gastroenterology. He was a founding member of the UK and European Primary Care Societies of Gastroenterology and has served on the Scientific Art Committee of the United European Gastroenterology Organization. With over 200 publications, Professor Hunjin is aware of the complexities of symptom, symptom interpretation and management challenges in patients presenting with digestive problems, particularly reflux-like symptoms. He's worked recently with pharmacists to develop strategies for initial management of people with reflux-like symptoms. Welcome, Dr. Hunjin. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. And a very warm welcome to uh, uh, colleagues and participants uh, from all over the world. It's uh, wonderful to be able to have this dialogue with people who are very much at the front line of dealing with problems. Pharmacists are the first uh, group of health professionals that uh, the person is going to consult. And I'm sure that this is a heavy responsibility and one that requires very careful management. Next slide. What I'd like to do is to present, prevent a fairly back to basics uh, clinical overview of the world of uh, reflux and dyspepsia. And of course, things are never as simple as they might seem. The first question to ask is, reflux and dyspepsia, are they the same or are they different? These terms are used interchangeably in different parts of the world. So there are two groups of people, at least there used to be two groups of people, the splitters, who said that reflux problems were quite different and separate from uh, dyspepsia problems, um, implying that uh, reflux problems were to do with the esophagus and that uh, dyspepsia problems were to do with the stomach and other parts of the GI tract. So let's have a look at the potential causes of this because in order to understand how to deal with the person presenting in the pharmacy or indeed um, in the clinical setting in medicine, we need to understand the causes and the underlying background of these symptoms. Next slide. Uh, next, next slide, please. So let's look at the size of the problem first. The overall rate of upper gastrointestinal symptoms in the community is extremely high. And I doubt if there's anybody either on the panel or who is a participant who has not experienced upper GI symptoms at some stage. But if we take into account um, GI, upper GI symptoms, which have been present uh, relatively recently to a point where they have been troublesome, then in fact, in the community, the overall rate is up to 40%. And uh, the number of patients, uh, the prevalence of reflux-like symptoms, and we'll come to that definition in a moment, is 20%. So these are huge problems. The number of people who suffer these symptoms um, is absolutely massive. There is, of course, a great deal of overlap between what you and I might call reflux-like symptoms and dyspepsia. And of course, if you want to get down to absolute basics, you might say that reflux-like symptoms are due to items in the stomach splashing into the esophagus and that dyspepsia symptoms are related to the stomach and other parts of the GI tract. But of course, life is not as simple as that. But if we were to split the two, then the chief symptoms for reflux-like problems are of course, heartburn, a feeling of burning, um, a difficulty of uh, um, and being unable to get rid of a discomfort in the lower part of the chest, upper part of the abdomen, a feeling of regurgitation, which means food appearing to go into the gullet, into the esophagus, often ending up at the back of the mouth. Of course, non-specific um, chest discomfort can be heartburn and uh, can be uh, uh, due to uh, reflux-like uh, problems. We have to watch out for cardiac problems. That's absolutely crucial. The last thing one wants to do is to diagnose a reflux-like problem only for it to turn out to have a cardiac cause. So you can see this is a complex area requiring clinical judgment. Dyspepsia, on the other hand, in other words, if you were looking at things which you think are not necessarily related to the esophagus, is more likely to be epigastric discomfort and is usually described as indigestion. 
But of course, again, dyspepsia is not necessarily just coming from the stomach. It may be coming from the duodenum or more commonly, in fact, um, from the gallbladder because of gallstones or other problems and an overlap with all sorts of other gastrointestinal difficulties. So I don't envy the pharmacist having to untangle all these difficulties, but let's see what we can do in terms of thinking a little bit further about these kind of symptoms. Next slide. So what are the causes of reflux-like symptoms, which I referred to earlier as heartburn or regurgitation? And in the following presentations, there'll be more detail about the actual nature of these symptoms. So gastroesophageal reflux, to put it back into simple terms, which means reflux from the stomach into the esophagus, is usually due to stomach contents refluxing. But of course, stomach contents means food, also means the acid that's in the stomach to digest the food, pepsin, which is a, an important enzyme, and of course, bile, which may uh, reflux into the stomach and may end up in the esophagus as well. Now, reflux-like symptoms are generally speaking not due to excessive acid. We often say to people, oh, I think you've got excessive acid. Now, excessive acid is really present in a very rare syndrome called the zollinger ellison syndrome. And that is when there is much more acid in the stomach than there should be. And this is an actual disease problem. In normal circumstances, uh, the symptoms are not due to excessive acid. It's just that the acid is sometimes in the wrong place in the esophagus, causing inflammation or it could be due to the fact that the uh, oesophagus has become highly sensitized. Again, we'll come to that in a second, but, but the important thing to remember that nearly half of the people who are likely to see us in the pharmacy or in the, uh, in the clinical office don't actually have their so-called reflux-like symptoms due to this reflux of stomach contents. These symptoms are called functional. And of course, as you can imagine, because they are functional, they're quite difficult to treat. So these non-reflux symptoms, again, not due entirely to reflux or directly related to reflux, may be related to uh, hypersensitivity of the esophagus or to what we now call gut-brain interactions or the so-called functional problems, rather like the irritable bowel syndrome that is seen so commonly. Of course, and I will continue to stress this throughout my presentation, we have to watch out for cancer signs and symptoms as well. And uh, the prevalence of adenocarcinoma, which is a carcinoma at the lower end of the esophagus at the junction with the stomach is certainly rising, especially in Western countries. Next slide. So what are the causes of dyspepsia, which is the, you, you could argue this more stomach side of things? Well, it depends on where you are. In Western countries, um, where the rate of Helicobacter pylori infection is now extremely low, duodenal and peptic ulcers are really quite rare, much less than 5% in any series of uh, endoscopies in patients suffering from these symptoms. In fact, in the United Kingdom, the rate is probably under 2%. So diagnosing a uh, duodenal ulcer or a stomach ulcer, which is a peptic ulcer, is actually quite relatively rare in most Western countries, but this may not be the case in countries where helicobacter in pylori infection rates are higher. We also have to watch out for biliary and pancreatic problems. And don't forget that gallstones and problems with stones stuck in the biliary duct or the common bile duct can often produce symptoms which are very similar to both reflux-like symptoms and dyspepsia. And again, as I keep stressing, in the back of our minds, we have to watch out for symptoms of cancer. Next slide. So what are the red flags? I've mentioned cancer a few times. Well, the patient's overall state is the main thing to look for. I appreciate that in a pharmacy setting, it's not always possible to examine a patient and to do a thorough physical, but questions along loss of appetite, weight loss, unintended weight loss, blood loss, uh, that is to say, say vomiting blood or dark stools. These are important uh, fl red flags, which we need to watch for. Many other uh, uh, symptoms and signs as well, especially if blood tests are taken, but this is at least is the first screening level. 
if a patient presents with a new onset of symptoms, and particularly if they are older, that should make us more aware of a potential problem. If the symptoms have been present for a very long time, one can start to relax just a little bit. Difficulty swallowing, this might mean that there's a tumor or a cancer somewhere in the esophagus, the lower part of the esophagus or in the stomach area. Persistent pain is another warning sign. And of course, if symptoms are not relieved with simple remedies. So if you do prescribe something, sell something and it doesn't seem to work, that's something to watch out for. Why hasn't the item that you've, what hasn't the, why, why has the action that you've started not worked? Next slide, please. Now the initial management is of course based on general management. And I, and I put these there because these are important items which we all sometimes forget about because it's so easy to prescribe or to sell something. But regardless of a prescription or something from the pharmacy, it is important to consider these items because they are well established now. And we have a new paper coming out shortly which uh, establishes the value of these through a series of uh, research projects. So whether or not the patient is prescribed anything or given a medication, this list is quite important. Avoiding trigger, trigger foods, especially carbonated drinks, reducing alcohol intake, and of course, smoking sensation, a low fat diet, avoiding overeating. Overeating is a real problem because once the stomach is over full, that the chances of reflux are improved, they get worse weight control. And in the management of these symptoms, even a moderate level of weight loss helps. So losing three or four kilograms can make an incredible difference. And I think that's quite important. Avoiding tight clothing, and of course, a raising the head of the bed, particularly the symptoms occur more at nighttime. Even if they don't occur at nighttime, using more pillows or raising the head, head of the bed by putting say a brick or something uh, between four and six inches may help the uh, reflux symptoms to settle because that will reduce the possibility of reflux occurring. Sleeping on the left side may help because in that way, there's a less likelihood, a reduced likelihood of uh, uh, refluxate con contents from the stomach going into the esophagus. And of course, the next step is to make sure that people don't lie down after meals and uh, to, to stay upright, possibly even to walk around a little and keeping a decent interval between eating the last meal and bedtime. Three hours is considered very reasonable. And last but not least, most importantly, stress management and disordered sleep problems are frequently associated with these symptoms. And that's something to think about. Next slide. Now in the pharmacy, how might one proceed? I think the first step has to be, which I'm sure everyone on the, on the, uh, uh, who, is, who is listening today will appreciate, it's important to ensure that it is safe to advise the patient. You don't want to be advising a patient in whom there might be a serious problem. And I'm sure that everyone who is watching today will be aware of this um, group of uh, uh, medications or preparations that you might want to think about, antacids, alginate and antacid combinations, and I'll come to those in a moment, acid suppression medications, the H2RAs and the PPIs, although the H2RAs have a much reduced role in the management of reflux-like symptoms than the PPIs. And then the big question is, how and when should we use the PPIs? And I'm going to cover that very briefly now. Next slide. First, the use of alginates and alginate acid combinations. Again, the strap line, please ensure that it is safe to advise the patient uh, that there isn't something happening there for which the patient needs to go and see a doctor, a gastroenterologist or a general practitioner with enough knowledge to deal with this. Now the alginates and uh, the alginate acid combinations work by providing mucosal protection. That is to say they line the lower end of the esophagus then they stick to the lower end of the esophagus and protect the mucosa from those stomach contents which may be causing difficulty. They also provide a raft on the top of the uh, stomach contents covering the acid pocket. The acid pocket is the residue of acid that gathers after a meal has been taken frequently on top of the, the meal. And it's that bit of the acid that when 
splashing into the esophagus can cause symptoms. The big advantage of the alginates and alginate acid combinations is that they are not absorbed and they can be used either in conjunction with meals or together with uh, other acid suppression therapies if better control is to be obtained. And this is now evidence-based. Next slide. So how and when to use PPIs? And this is quite a big question because over-the-counter availability varies from country to country. In the United Kingdom, where I live and practice, you can buy lower dose PPIs over the counter after a consultation with a pharmacist. You can't buy them simply by picking them up and paying for them. You need a consultation with a pharmacist. But um, the normal standard dose PPIs can only be obtained by uh, a consultation with a doctor. But I know that in other parts of the world, you can often buy these over the counter directly or actually only after um, consulting with a pharmacist. So this is an important factor. How, if you are in that setting, should you handle PPI in a patient who appears to have either reflux-like symptoms or dyspepsia, whichever way you want to put it, whether you're a splitter or a lumper? Well, the right thing to do is to start the patient on for four weeks with a standard dose. Um, and the instruction should be clear. The PPI should be taken 20 minutes before the first meal of the day. And the reason for that is that by taking the PPI before the meal is taken, the proton pump is told to switch off. And then when the food arrives, the proton pump is switched off and acid is not produced. So it's produced at a lower level. That is why it's important to take them before the first meal of the day. They should be taken regularly. The reason for taking them regularly is that they are not PRN drugs. They take two or three days to get into action. Perhaps um, in terms of uh, the blood levels, they may reach a, an acceptable peak within the first uh, six to 12 hours, but their if clinical effect takes somewhat longer. So if you only take them every now and then, they are much less likely to work. If after four weeks, things have not improved, then I think it's important to say, look, there may be something else happening. Perhaps we're not dealing with a, an acid responsive reflux-like problem. So just to repeat, it's important not to use them on an intermittent basis. It's important to uh, wait for them to start working and it's important to take them regularly. So a non-response is a clear signal for further action. Next slide. So just to recap, and this is my final slide, I think it's difficult for any clinician, a gastroenterologist, a general practitioner, or at any level, and a pharmacist, particularly because of the lack of investigative facilities there, it's very difficult to distangle the causes of the symptoms from the actual symptoms. It's a hard job. Reflux-like and indigestion symptoms are very common in the community. Please watch out for patients with a risk of serious problems, the so-called red flags, and also from your knowledge of the patient about the quality uh, of response to what you've prescribed. And I think that general lifetime measures are important with or without, without medications. Consider alternate acid combinations. Consider a stepped approach, reserving PPIs for a little later after the initial advice. And if symptoms do not resolve well or in good time, please reconsider the situation. It may be time for medical help. Thank you. Over to you, Thank Amy. you so much for that. All right. Uh, I really enjoyed that uh, pathophysiology refresher. I was also really impressed with the statistics on H. pylori. I think that as someone who focuses in a GI clinic, I perceived it to be a lot higher prevalence than some of the statistics that you were uh, stating. And I think that I would really re-emphasize the idea of timing with regard to meals and expectation setting in terms of timing are really important ways that we can empower our patients to understand the health conditions and make sure that the medications that they're using are the most effective for them. Next up, we have Brett McFarland. He graduated as a pharmacist from the University of Queensland in 1993 
and managed community pharmacies in metropolitan, metropolitan and regional Queensland for a number of years before completing his PhD in skin science at UQ Medical School. He's an experienced medical writer, public speaker, and podcaster, and his primary clinical interests are dermatology and gastroenterology. Welcome, Brett. Thanks. Thanks very much, Amy, and um, thanks to Professor uh, Hanjam for a good overview of the situation in terms of reflux. It certainly made my job a lot easier. Uh, thank you. The next slide. So I'm going to be talking about um, patient health literacy in relation to reflux particularly and the role of the pharmacist. Um, in helping people understand their condition a little bit better and also in helping them to treat it appropriately. So I sat down and I came up with six areas of uh, health literacy where the pharmacists can be directly involved. You might be able to come up with more of those, but they are around the terminology that we use. And when I say the terminology we use, as I say our patients, as well as ourselves, as well as our health colleagues, uh, general practitioner colleagues, etc. Uh, identifying when reflux episodes are troublesome um, and that reflux is not just about heartburn. Uh, Self-care with diet and lifestyle, managing over-the-counter medicines and matching those with the patient's specific needs and then the judicious use of PPIs and the role of the pharmacist there. Thanks, next slide, thanks. So as Professor Hundred said, the terminology that is involved in this area is very broad. And I think that a patient's use of words like reflux, heartburn, um, and regurgitation may not necessarily map to what our understanding of those terms are as healthcare providers. And they might not even be the types of uh, terminology that a patient would describe their symptoms to us as pharmacists. They might be using simple language like, I have a burning cessation, or I have this burning cessation that um, I sometimes goes up into my throat. Or they might actually have been doing some um, pre-study on the internet about their symptoms and have self-diagnosed themselves with GERD or with GERD, depending on what area of the world you're in. Or, or they might have found complications of reflux, including esophagitis and, and other serious concerning ones. So I think that's a very important thing for us as pharmacists to do in the first instance is to get to the bottom of what the symptoms are that the person is using based on the ref on the uh, references and the terminology that they are using to you. And also to speak back to the person with those words that they have used themselves. Because if we start using terms like reflux and heartburn and they are terms that the person knows or that they are terms that that person associates with something else, um, then we won't necessarily be helping them with their own um, self-care and health literacy. Thanks, next slide. I think the first thing, um, and Dr. Uh, Professor Anjan actually talked about this, is obviously to identify the scope of um, the person's condition. Um, reflux episodes are perfectly normal. Not everyone will experience symptoms. Um, some will experience infrequent symptoms, some will experience more frequent symptoms, and some people will brush them off and say, oh, I've just got a bit of tummy upset, I'm not too worried about it, but some people will be seeking our help um, in terms of treatment, but also in terms of helping them to understand what they're experiencing. And then it's important for us to identify with the patient that at this stage, um, you know, if their symptoms aren't too bad or if they're not experiencing them frequently, that they can be self-managed. They can be self-managed without a prescription, but in some instances, um, then, for example, if an over-the-counter medicine doesn't help or if their symptoms get worse or if they are concerning symptoms, that we as pharmacists would be suggesting that they uh, speak to a doctor. Thanks. Next slide. So um, Professor Hange 
covered this, but I wanted to also just raise that, um, as he mentioned, it's not all about acid. In fact, in many cases, it's not about acid at all. And it's not all about the esophagus because we can, uh, as patients can be talking to you about completely different, seemingly completely different areas of anatomy and the symptoms that they're uh, experiencing. But in some cases, these symptoms can be mapped back to um, caused by reflux aid and things like um, difficulty with the voice, changing voice quality or hoarseness, um, a burning in the throat that doesn't seem to go away, a painful um, swallowing event. And as um, Professor Hunjin mentioned, that's definitely you know, a point of referral for us as pharmacists. Uh, but cough, for example, cough is a, a significant or chronic cough, particularly cough that sort of lasts about eight weeks or, or longer, um, is uh, commonly referred to a, a specialist um, and like in an ear, nose and throat, for example, but they might find in quite a significant proportion of cases that the cough is not necessarily due to a lung condition, for example, that it is actually due to reflux. So these sorts of terms as well, I think we need to be um, looking out for as to whether or not we recommend an immediate referral or trialing of something simple like an antacid or an alginate to see if their symptoms uh, improve uh, before referring. Thank you, next slide. And um, he's already covered this, but again, these are the sorts of things that I think as pharmacists, we need to at least think about what our priority questions are going to be in this instance. I don't imagine that we're going to be spending uh, a half an hour talking to people about red flags, but um, you know, pick the, the low hanging fruit as it were about um, investigating without concerning the person, but whether or not um, you know, these things like, you know, vomiting or is associated or chest pain as um, as uh, Professor Hunjan actually mentioned is, is the most important one there. But um, there are red flags uh, and we need to be aware of those and we need to help the patient understand um, that if any of these things do happen, even if they're not happening to them at this moment, um, that that's a concerning outcome and that they should be seeking uh, advice from uh, a doctor immediately or, or an emergency department. Thank you. Next slide. So when it comes to talking about diet and lifestyle, I think from a patient literacy point of view, we shouldn't assume that our patient is aware of these simple things that can be done, uh, of the simple things that might be triggering uh, their reflux that they can easily address and self-treat uh, in order to avoid having to use a medicine or in order to avoid having to use a medicine over long periods of time. Um, I reflect on a situation in a pharmacy where um, I was speaking to a mother of a uh, daughter who was a young teen who I was concerned about because we wouldn't normally expect to see such um, reflux symptoms in someone of, of that age, even though it can happen. And I just casually asked um, the mother what sort of diet her daughter was, was taking. And it turns out that she was drinking actually probably about two litres um, of cola uh, drink per day. When, I mean, I didn't, I didn't judge, um, I just sort of said, um, uh, did, you know, did she have an understanding really that um, the cola could possibly have been a cause of the patient, of her daughter's reflux, and she was completely unaware. So I don't think we should be making assumptions that these simple things um, that the patient can do themselves are commonly known by the patient and this is something that we can talk to them about uh, relatively easily. Thank you. Next slide. As pharmacists, we have a role in advising the patient on what is the most appropriate treatment for their needs. Now, that might simply be that um, if they're only having uh, irregular cases of reflux, 
um, if they know that it's after a particular type of food that they consume or beverage that they consume, or that if they um, lie down too quickly after uh, dinner that it happens to them, it doesn't happen very often. Um, then something simple like alginate with or without an antacid is going to be appropriate for that patient. I think we probably do need to uh, help them understand that something like a PPI is more likely to be appropriate for someone with daily symptoms than, um, you know, ad hoc PRN sort of sort type symptoms. But also for those patients who do need to take a daily PPI, it's also our role to talk to them about um, what happens if they get breakthrough symptoms? So these are quite common, even if they're taking their PPI religiously every day before breakfast, um, they can get breakthrough symptoms and what do they should they be doing about those? And that's again where alginate or antacid combinations become handy because um, they can address them quickly. Uh, it's also important to understand the role that the simple over-the-counter medicines like alginates and antacids play for those people who have been using PPIs over long periods of time uh, and it's desired by their physician or by themselves or by from a discussion with yourselves as pharmacists that they'd like to have a go at reducing their PPI use and how uh, alginates and antacids can be very important in helping with the breakthrough pain that can happen as a result of reducing PPI use. Next slide, thanks. So um, Professor Hanjin covered this, but I, I just wanted to reiterate the pharmacist's role in the judicious use of PPIs. I think he spoke um, very well about how um, they do, they are not quick onset um, treatments. I mean, though people will get a certain amount of relief from um, the first dose of a PPI, but it takes a couple of days for them to reach their maximum effect of knocking out the proton pumps. So that has to be communicated to a patient who thinks that they're taking a PPI as opposed to alginate antacid because it is the strongest. Um, and in the case of someone who only has infrequent symptoms, then it's going to be much better for them to be using something that works quickly. They might only last for, um, you know, an hour or so, uh, as in the, is the case of an antacid or a few more hours, four hours-ish, as in, is in the case of alginate. But they don't really need to be reaching for a PPI um, if they only have infrequent symptoms. Um, and talking to them about the lowest dose. In Australia, it's actually quite common for a, um, a person to be um, prescribed a higher dose initially. There are definitely changes that have happened in the last couple of years around that, and higher doses are, are now reserved for um, specialist prescriptions, but um, it might be um, something that we need to just reiterate. Yes, it is the lower dose, but it's going to be appropriate for you. Um, Let's re-talk and rediscuss it in that four to six week, four to eight week period after you've commenced um, the PPI. And if you don't think that it's significant enough, then we'll talk to you, you about recommending to go back to see your doctor. Um, if it gets to the stage, of course, where um, they have taken it, the PPI for um, a certain period of time, and um, the uh, the doctor starts just sort of talking to them about, well, I think we need to probably look at alternative uh, approaches for you and we're going to you know, talk about a de-prescribing event, then again, that's where the pharmacist can come in and just talk to the patient about what to expect um, during that process of slowly reducing the dose of the PPI. They might be starting to take it every second day, ensuring that they've got something at home like an antacid alginate combination to help with the breakthrough symptoms that might happen when the dosage of the PPI is being reduced. Um, but also as well, even though just so someone is taking a chronic PPI, it doesn't mean that at some stage they may not experience some of the uh, long-term adverse effects um, that have been identified through epidemiological studies not necessarily causal studies, but you know these studies that show increased numbers of people on long-term courses of PPI who 
um, may have reduced bone mineral density or might have increased risk of gut infections or might have increased risk of anemia because they're not absorbing iron or B12 as well as what they would do if they had uh, a higher acid in the stomach. So um, again, from a health literacy perspective, I don't think we should be scaring people around these proposed long-term effects of adverse effects of PPIs, but we, I think, have a responsibility to at least raise them with our patients who are taking these medicines over um, periods extend, uh, uh, extending past 12 months, for example. And certainly, again, to reiterate, if any of those red, red flag symptoms occur, that you know they should be not coming back to see you, that they should be going to their doctor or to an emergency department immediately. Next slide, thanks. Now, for a patient, that's actually a huge amount to take in. Um, so this is where the pharmacist should be providing them with written information. If you don't have that kind of written information available um, in your practice yourself, there's so many sources of these um, patient, easily understood patient um, leaflets that can be accessed through the internet, um, through jurisdictions. Most health jurisdictions will have them. And if, if your local health jurisdiction doesn't have one, you can always find valuable information through uh, an American website or a Canadian or UK website, uh, and definitely to print them and to provide them uh, to, the, to the person. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brett. That was really informative. Uh, I think that that's a really important emphasis at the end of the concept of written information. I know that one of the things I stress to my students uh, when I teach this every week is that it the numbers are somewhere upwards of 19% of patients in the United States that are adult age read at or below the lowest uh, literacy level. So trying to really hone any sort of leaflet or information that you're given vetted through an organization that's able to focus on best practices for written communication and ensuring that our patients are able to access that. I know that we've done a lot of work with FIP and infographics and things of those nature that can be more readily attained for people with low literacy rates. Next up, we have Michael Bovin. He is a clinical pharmacist, consultant, and continuing education developer and the president of ComFarm Consulting Incorporated. In 2009, he left full-time pharmacy practice to pursue a career in continuing education and consulting and has developed more than 500 accredited continuing education activities for pharmacists, physicians, and allied health care professionals. Great, thanks so much, Amy. Thanks, um, Dr. Hunchen and Brett for their excellent presentations. I'm going to review a little bit about health literacy is what I was going to focus on, which is quite different. It's really how do you take that incredible information that you heard from our previous two speakers and really translate it to that patient sitting in practice. So my first slide is this one I put in to AI and I asked him, you know, I'm going to do a question on GERD or dyspepsia or heartburn. And this image came up. I have no idea what it stands for, but I thought it worked pretty well for heartburn. Maybe it's the acid. So one of the key things that I focus on in the work that I do is knowledge translation. And one of the hardest things that we do from a clinician standpoint, from a pharmacist standpoint, is to take information that is published within guidelines or evidence-based and translate it to that person sitting in front of you in practice. So for example, this is the American guidelines. It's one of the more recent guidelines that have been published on the management of gastroesophageal reflux disease. There are three full pages of recommendations that are there from diagnosis to follow-up. And what's really difficult for pharmacists is really how do you take this information, which can be quite complex, and manage patients within pharmacy practice and develop action plans to really improve the outcomes of those overall patients. And I have a strong lesson from health literacy. I never thought this was an issue. I thought I was an incredible counselor when I graduated. I spent a lot of time with my individual patients and it worked well until one day I found out I had an issue. And many of you use these, these type of labels that you would actually see on, on different type of products. These are the pharmacy you know, notification labels that we attach to the bottle. And as you can see from, from looking at me, I have no hair here, lots of gray here. I've been around for a long period of time. And the first statin that was released on the market was actually Lovastatin. And Lovastatin was a drug that you, as you're probably all aware of, has to be taken with food. 
And what we had at the time is we actually had this label here on the left-hand side with a hot dog to take with food. Six months later, the patient that we had started on lobostatin comes back in and she's complaining that her cholesterol is not getting any better since she started on the lobostatin. It's actually getting worse over that period of time. Lots of investigations. We thought of adherence. We thought of all these issues that arise. But fundamentally, what the issue was is she actually was taking every meal, having a hot dog because it was what's on her label. And she thought this was the normal course of action that she should be doing. So why I say this to you is that health literacy is a significant issue for your patients. Many of these people won't understand necessarily what information you're reflecting upon them. And this is really important. We heard from Brett and Professor Hunchen, lots of great information, but it's really how do you translate to that person sitting in front of you? Without understanding what these patients or what they understand, what you're delivering, we can offer optimal care. And if you look at these are just examples of patients, but health literacy, is there an issue? Is it which of these patients would be at the highest overall risk? And if you look at some of the, the, the data on this side of the Atlantic Ocean, we know that nearly nine in 10 adults have difficulty understanding health information. Now we think of this as just regular literacy, and that's not the case. To actually identify your symptoms, knowing that it's a potential problem, and then working through the healthcare system, only one in 10 individuals can do that effectively. Now, we know that it can be in lower socioeconomic groups and minority groups, but it actually occurs in all ages, races, incomes, and education levels. So don't assume if somebody's a professor that they would know all this information. It's really trying to translate that information as easily as possible for that person. Now, if I look back at my pharmacy school, and Amy can probably comment on this as well, but this is the way we actually provide most of our care. This is us talking, and we would actually finish off it and just say, oh, do you have any questions? And the patient would fundamentally say, no, everything is good, Mike. It's all perfect. But what I've known over the years that have done this is that in reality, this is what we typically end up saying, that patients have a difficult time comprehending, understanding the information we're providing. And so stats on this is actually the reason why is... I can tell you, and this is from, from clinical research that has been done, that 40 to 80% of information provided to your patient, think of it, more than half actually is forgotten almost immediately. And the more information that we provide, the less that is remembered. And of the information that's remembered, 50% of it that is remembered is incorrect. So we're seeing some questions that are coming in our Q&A. So think about when you're providing this and educating your patients, is that many of these patients will not necessarily remember that crucial information that's there. So it's really why I put these questions at the bottom. It's really asking you, how are you assessing health literacy in your patients and how is it affecting the care you provide your patients? What are the key information that you really need to get across? Now, I thought about this one and I wanted to think, what are the key things that I'd want to do to actually improve health literacy in the management of reflux, heartburn, and ingestion? And you can use these across any OTC or common or minor ailment component. The first one is thinking less is more versus asking versus the check. And we'll talk about that. And I'll get on a soapbox for a minute. Think about every word that you're saying to the patient, the importance of a summarizing it, and then we'll talk about teach back. So let's start with less is more. And again, I, I'm here on this side of the Atlantic Ocean here in Canada. And this was something from our previous diabetes guidelines is looking at levels of learning. And what's crucial is we think as pharmacists is that the more information that we provide our individual patients, the better off they're going to be. But what we know in diabetes, and this is where some work has been done, is that there are three key levels. There's survival or basic level information, intermediate, and advanced. And we always assume that patients want advanced level. But a good chunk of our patients will only want basic or survival information. So it's trying to think of what is the absolute most important information that you get across for those patients. So we need to individualize the content that you provide to your patients, looking at ensuring that they understand that basic level of information. So what are some of the examples that you heard from Professor Hunjin and from Brett today is looking at survival level or basic level information is you really need to know red flags. If you get this, I want you to do this. The cause and effect. If you eat this or you don't do this OTC or non-pharmacological recommendation, it will lead to this effect. And we wanna talk about the treatment plan. I want you to do this and how you can do it within your practice. Remembering that providing more could actually make things worse. So less is a lot of times more. Strategies to consider when you're educating people with low health literacy. Remember, this is nine out of 10 individual patients that are sitting in your practice. 
the first thing you do is provide essential information only. Now, it's great when we're doing 15 minute presentations that there's less fluff on this when we try to get that key information across you. And I want you to think about that when you're educating your patients. So things coming up and, and that I looked at to simplify it as symptoms caused by what, you know, essential information, the symptoms you have are caused by excess acid coming up from your stomach. It's made worse by different foods or triggers or situations. And the treatment that I'm giving you can really help and make you know, you know, make you know you're going to have heartburn. If you're going to be providing information, always apply the essential information first. And different ways, so I do a lot of work within the vaccine space, so patients are always concerned about benefits and risks. Be careful when you say, you know, what the denominators that you end up using. 99% effective is better than 1% than chance. So you really want to make sure that you pick the right numerators and denominators when you're actually using this as well. In the US, and again, this is such a great tool that's there, it's called the Ask Me 3. And these are questions that patients have to know regarding any condition that they have is what is the main problem? What do I need to do? And why is it important for me to do this? So think of those three questions. If your patients know these three issues, then they'll be able to effectively manage any, really any common disease that we end up seeing with the prescription or you know, an OTC based product or an OTC condition. Um, it is crucial that we make sure that we provide that information for our patients. So again, what is the main problem? What does a patient need to do? And why is it important for them to do this? One of the key things as we move to minor ailments or common ailments across the, uh, the world is that every time I do a presentation for continuing education on any common ailment, the first question that patient, uh, the pharmacist always asks me is, Mike, do you have a checklist that I can end up using where I can just check the information off on a form? Okay, do they have this? Yes, yes, yes. So similar to what a pilot does on a consistent basis. I think that's fine from the basis, but the, the problem is what I've seen as I've watched students do and I've watched pharmacists do it, the focus is always on the form. It's always, always, always on the form. So it's just to try to check that component on the form. What I always worry about that is that if it's not, if the patient has a more complex issue or the patient has other issues, sometimes it's missed and it actually really can impact the overall the quality of the care. What I find is, again, we focus a lot of times on the form that we have for our patients within a common ailment system. And we require this a lot of times for payment or for our, our scope of practice. But I really want you to try to think a little bit differently than just focusing on these forms. One of the things here for most common ailments, I like to use three open-ended questions. And I know when I say this to pharmacists, they say, Mike, there is no way I want to open up a question and have the person go off on a diatribe of you telling me everything that's going on in their life. But these three questions can make it really easy to actually identify some of the issues. And it can actually, a lot of times, complete the form. So the first question for, again, any OTC or common ailments is, can you describe your symptoms? And then that can lead into a little bit more information of talking about red flags, how long they've ended up having it, how much it's impacted. Can you tell me about your health or other medical conditions? You know what, we have an older patient that's standing in front of you. If they have other conditions that could be worsened by this, this could be a potential issue. And what have you done so far? You know what, there's nothing worse than if you're recommending alginate for a patient and they've been using it for the last two years. So really, we want to know and what's made it better and what's made it worse. The third one is to think about every word. What does a patient need to know? Remember, most of the information is going to be forgotten. So simplify, simplify, simplify. Use their own description. So we heard this from Brett as well. So I, again, in Canada, one of the key things that we might hear is, what I, as I'm summarizing to patient is what I've heard from you is you're having some gut rot and you're burping all the time. And it's happening a few times a week and it's really happening when you have spicy food. So regurgitating the same, you know, regurg, I didn't do that intentionally, but pushing that main information back to that individual patient. So they can hear, they know that you've heard them and you're repeating it. One thing that I've really been focusing on is minimizing nuance. We like to give patients a hundred different options and there is actual data that's out there saying that the more options that we provide the patient, sometimes the more confusing it can be. So you have within your clinical experience to be able to say, well, maybe I get down to a couple of options and work with the patient through a shared decision model. So, you know, example of this is based on what you said, I'm going to recommend this drug that you'll take before meals that you know causes heartburn. It only has to be taken when you need it. So really being that key information that they need to provide. As Brett mentioned, any other information that you can use within videos, uh, written material and images, 
And then the importance of follow-up. And that's one thing that pharmacists have always struggled with. So things in and collaborative care. So this one is really, I'm gonna let your doctor know that you were here. And if you don't get any better in the next few days, let me know. And then we can look at different options that are there as well. The power of summary. Summary is always verify what the patient has is, is told you. So you know what, this is what I heard from you. Did I get that right? So this is just in making sure that again, you're capturing that key information. So less chance of an error, more importance of actually engaging the patient in this, this basis as well. Ensure they're involved. The shared decision model is important regarding any disease state that you have. The patient's not engaged and involved. They are likely going to become not adherent or not necessarily follow the instructions that you provided. So an example of this is what I heard from you is that you want something to help your heartburn that is a pill and easy to take. Does that seem right? Summarize the next steps. Symptoms, impact, treatment plan, and who's going to do what. Teachback is such a valuable tool that we end up using, and I use it a lot within the respiratory space. So let me show you how to use your inhaler. You know, you show me how to use that inhaler, right? The key things when you're using Teachback is that you can actually identify really how well you explained it to the patient or how well they comprehended what you explained to them. What's important here is not a test of the patient's knowledge. It's really how well you explain the concept. So the way you can say to a patient where you say, well, I, it feels like I'm testing them. It's not a test. It's, I always say, I always make it about me. I just wanted to check how well I explained this to you today. What are three things that you're going to do tomorrow to treat your heart? Or another example this could be is, how are you going to explain to your child or spouse about your condition and what we talked about today? Clarify and check again. If you find that there's some misunderstandings with this and explain it a little bit different, look for different approaches and then ask the patient to teach back again. Make sure they understand the information within their own words. And then the show me method is really helpful for any disease state is that I've noticed that many people have trouble remembering how to take their heartburn medication. Can you show me what you're gonna do and how you're gonna take it? So really simplify messages that can make a huge difference in actually improving the overall. So I think it's important that we rethink the way that we educate, what you can do to be more impactful in your practice tomorrow. Remember, effective information and education is not about providing all information. Use our relationships to move people from survival or basic information to moderate to advanced. So again, if somebody's having reflux all the time, we can add a little bit more of information at a time. One thing that we focus on is that when a patient is diagnosed with a disease state or has an ailment, we load them up with a ton of information as soon as they are actually diagnosed. But the one advantage that pharmacists have is our contact with our patients. We see them regularly and consistently. What I've actually found very effective is you provide a little bit of information and then you build upon that information each time you end up seeing this patient. So again, it's not about flooding them with everything. It's giving them the information that they need to take care of. Ask the patient about their symptoms, their health, their previous treatment, using open-ended questions that can give you a wealth of information that can lead to other questions to really tailor the care for that individual. Listen, and I really mean this, listen to what your patients are telling you. It can make such a huge difference and it builds trust with that relationship. Summarize what you've heard and verify that you heard it correctly. Think about what you say. Can you make it easier? Did you focus on the most important information first? So really that key information that you end up having here. Teach back. You really can help to ensure the patient truly understands what they need to know. So that's the pretty much the, the breadth of my information and I'm gonna pass it over to Amy again. Thank you, Michael. I don't know how many times a week I harp on. Focus on the need to know, not the want to know, and asking them, what questions do you have? Phrasing it just like that assumes that there should be questions and that we want to answer, answer questions. So I think those are- 90%, really Amy, was the most terrifying thing. That's almost every single person that comes in practice doesn't understand basic health literacy. So even things such as taking out that, that, that uh, paracetamol or acetaminophen and you're using for infants and showing them on the syringe how much they have to draw out can make a huge difference to reduce the risk of an error for some of these individuals. So think about this as you're educating the patient on any of these overall conditions. I think we are 100% aligned in, in our teachings. All right, so up next we have Ruben Vallegas. He is with the FIP Practice Development Projects Coordinator. He's a pharmacist from Portugal with a master's degree in exercise and health 
from the Faculty of Human Kinetics in Lisbon. He is currently enrolled in a PhD program focusing on the promotion of physical activities through pharmacists. Uh, he's been involved in different associations and educational activities focusing on the areas of public health and pharmacy practice. Welcome, Ruben. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you all the colleagues for the, the presentations. It's always nice to uh, be reminded of, of, these, uh, of these topics and, and, and this information. Uh, besides providing here my FIP hat, so the resources that will present the FIP developed in the last months, last years, um, I also worked uh, in the community pharmacy in Portugal, in Spain, for, for at least two years. So, and as you can imagine, Portugal and Spain have really good food. So the cases of reflux in the pharmacy were uh, constant and were uh, always hard to deal. Uh, as Michael said, uh, sometimes explaining something as simple that acidic things will make it worse. Uh, so these kind of simple things that are obvious in, in general, but then in the practice might be a bit uh, harder. Um, moving to the presentation, uh, you can see that we have a, a microsite, a site that focuses on self-care. And in, on this site, you can see on the, on the slide, so it's prevention.fip uh, slash self-care. And you can also use the QR code on the screen to reach this page. And there you'll see all the resources related to self-care. And of course, uh, the resources uh, linked to reflux management. I'll, I'll present a bit in more detail but I, I won't bore you with this because you have all, everything uh, accessible there. So as you'll see on the next slide, one example that we have is um, one insight board that we did and Pali participated. So thank you so much for joining all these events and also the video that I'll mention later. Uh, this was an insight board for, with people from different uh, members of FIP from different parts of the globe to get some insights on how, how this is treated what types of PPIs they use. So just different insights on this area. Uh, and we produce a report that uh, it's member only access. So if you're a FAP member, you, you can get access to these insights. The other one that we have on the next slide you'll see is the, um, we, we did a short publication an open access. So it's a guide, a very short guide, quick reference guide is what we call it, uh, how to manage uh, reflux. And you can access on this link, so file 5436 or with the QR code that will guide you there. This one is open access, so it's it's available for everyone. It's very lean publication, very practical, with a lot of uh, images and, and schemes because I think that's more useful than very long handbooks with a lot of text and references. And we can see on the next slide, um, the first part. So this is the table of contents. So introduction, then we have causes, the patient experience, so the symptoms, the triaging part, pharmacological management, non-pharmacological, then some tips. And we also have two videos. Uh, one of the videos is from Professor Peter Karilas, and the second video is from uh, Pali Hangin that is present here. So you can also see these two videos. These are very short videos, around five to seven minutes. Um, if you don't have time to listen to a full lecture, then uh, on your break, you can you can put one of these videos and you have a lot of insights uh, in these short videos that are included also in the publication. So you can reach them through the publication or you can go to FIP YouTube page and you can also uh, click there and you'll find these specific videos on, on reflux. They're a bit of like a capsule uh, of content in this area. And going briefly through the publication on the next slide, you'll see uh, we have diagram on the causes. I mean, the experts already went through it, so I'll not go over it. So you can see the next slide. I will go a bit faster because this was already mentioned. Um, so we have some boxes with the main uh, symptoms and the red flags that were also mentioned before. Uh, the next one, you'll see also the triaging, so the questions, these are quite important for the pharmacists because they do need to be uh, very focused on the questions and and uh, sometimes go for the closer, closed questions because they know that the patient in front of them might talk for one hour if they do an open-end question, but sometimes people are also more closed. Um, so maybe we need a wider question, more open question to see 
uh, if we can find what was the the this time what was the problem if it was a cyst or if it was uh, some problem with the medication for example on the next slide you'll see um, some of the main pharmacological options so the antacids the alginates this was already mentioned but these are only a uh, reference for people to have the blocks and on the following slide you'll have the non-pharmacological options that were also already mentioned uh, eating smaller meals or um, avoiding uh, eating too much or before uh, bedtime uh, so these are also some tips that you can also see on the next um, slide you can have a bit of a flow chart uh, decisions try to remember okay was was uh, this the cause okay no 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 um, and then uh, go through the flow chart and try to see if there are some points that that were missing so this can also be used maybe printed you can put it in a pharmacy uh, and you can have a visual aid uh, that some sometimes some associations also do this for other uh, other types of, of self-care issues but for reflux we we summarize the entire lean publication in one flowchart that's also available on the publication and uh, i think we have one more no that's it so thank you so much thank you for having me um i hope you, you enjoy the publications go take a look at the videos they're quite well done, two experts on the field. And yeah, if you have any questions, happy to. Thank you so much, Ruben. All right, I think we're going to move into our Q&A. So we're gonna maybe stop sharing or everybody can come back on screen. I've been sort of reading through and triaging some of these Q&As and all of our panelists can also see them. I think we'll start off one that we left in there um, that was asking about from a pharmacodynamic and pharmacokinetic viewpoint, is there a concern for developing any other diseases when our main focus is on treating heartburn? And I thought I would field that to Brett to yeah. answer well, about that. Thank, thanks, Amy. So I think the first thing to say is that PPIs are awesome right? <laughs> they, they work really very well. Um, and they're awesome for people who have got chronic uh, reflux and, and concerning um, uh, uh, ongoing health conditions associated with re complications of reflux. But anything uh, that reduces um, gastric acid production significantly has potential for downstream effects on other things um, because acid is there for a reason. It's not just there to um, help us break up macromolecules in our diet. It also prevents bugs that uh, shouldn't be in our gastrointestinal tract from getting in through um, food. Uh, and it's also quite important for um, solubilizing micronutrients, particularly the bivalent cations like calcium, magnesium, iron, etc. So there are significant numbers of very, very large epidemiological studies which have uh, associated chronic PPI use um, with a number of ongoing health effects, including low bone mineral density and fracture risk. Um, uh, there's also, a, you know, reduced absorption of vitamin B12 and iron, which can um, impact on a person's uh, risk for uh, anemia. Um, uh, what else? I'm just I'm doing a presentation on this for a conference in a couple of weeks. I'm just going through my, my slides now. Uh, hypomagnesemia as well has been associated with that. Um, so, um, but in terms of directly linking chronic PPI use with um, some of these concerning long-term observations, we're not quite there yet. I think you could, you, we could make an assumption that it probably makes sense that if you've got, you know, significant patients who are uh, having decreased bone mineral density and that they are taking long-term PPIs, that there's and that there is an, a plausible 
uh, connection between those two things. That is that calcium absolutely requires um, acid to ionize uh, in the stomach uh, and, th and it needs to be ionized for it to be absorbed. Then these are the sorts of things that we can be talking to our patients who are taking PPOs for long periods of time, um, but just helping them again from a health literacy point of view to understand that, you know, they, they may, they, this may be something that might, they might experience. Um, they should be talking to their doctor about it if they are concerned, uh, particularly if they've got other risk factors. Um, like for example, if they've got a family history of osteoporosis, for example. Um, so, so yeah, it, it, it's a difficult thing to, to cover because the evidence for causal effect is, is not quite there yet. Perhaps um, the GP uh, colleague can, can talk further about that. <clears throat> yes, if you'd like me to. Um, I concur with uh, uh, what you've said, Brett, but I would go a step further and um, say that uh, uh, the question of uh, PPIs and side effects was rampant about 10 years ago and early papers around 2003. And um, I think we could, um, I don't want to oppose it too heavily, but we could label that as PPI hysteria. And I have a list of items which range from uh, fractures to uh, polyps, renal problems, the possibility of even getting COVID-19 if you're on PPIs later, stroke, um, you know, um, intestinal malabsorption. But I have to put this into touch now. You know, the second part of what you said is absolutely right. Uh, the meta-analyses that have come out by Salvo and others, uh, papers in uh, learned journals have shown that um, you can take PPIs long-term safely. And that, as you've said, there is a, uh, a kind of a temporal plausibility to some of this, but in reality, this has not been borne out. Uh, I, I'm not sure that this is a particularly worrisome issue for us um, in terms of uh, responding to patients with these symptoms arriving in the pharmacy. But um, um, I, I'm, um, I'm not alarmed by the long-term use of PPIs based on current evidence, and I, I applaud what you've said. Thank you. I think it's difficult for pharmacists to... Sorry, sorry, Michael, you go ahead. Go, go ahead, Brett. No, please. I was going to say, I think it's difficult for pharmacists. I mean, we, we've only got a limited period of time to, to talk to patients about um, their medicines, whether it be a new medicine or an ongoing one. And we also don't want to concern, overly concern them about something that might not ever happen. Um, it's more along the lines if someone specifically asks us, I've been reading about, someone told me about this, that we have to have uh, a clear understanding of exactly, as you say, these, I mean, and there are some things like it's been linked to dementia, or it's been linked to, as you say, cardiovascular disease, um, and those have been knocked on the head, but we can't, um, um, we, we shouldn't be overly concerned. And also identifying what their other risk factors for those particular concerns might be, um, maybe it's worthwhile referring for a further discussion if, if that's necessary. So I was just going to add to that. So one of the key things is short term. So the question also worried about, am I going to end up hurting this patient by giving them a PPI? And this was a question that happened here in Canada as we made 14 day supply of PPI for occasional heartburn over the counter, similar to what was offered within the US. And the data shows that basically 14 days of this for a patient, if they respond well in those 14 days, it's unlikely that they have, if they respond well, it's unlikely they have another condition such as a cardiovascular condition. If within 14 days they're not seeing a significant improvement, it could be something else. So the worry, the concern about adenocarcinomas or in terms of cardiovascular, that PPI can give you some information regarding it. Now, that being said, still screen for all those red flags and to be careful with it. I love what uh, Professor Hunjin said about uh, long-term use of PPIs in terms of the safety, but from a health literacy standpoint, as we have these conversations with our patients, there are so many people that are taking PPIs that have no idea why they were taking them in the first place. So this was for NSAID protection. So they were prescribed something like naproxen and then given this on top of it. And as we move into our older adults and we have this huge polypharmacy burden, there's been a push within Canada and it's happened in other regions to maybe consider, a, could we actually pull these patients off of these therapies? 
there is an excellent, I'm going to do promotion for our country, but we have uh, deprescribing.org as actually one of the key groups here within Canada is really focused on how do you take a patient that may be a candidate for pulling off of a PPI. So if you wanted to have that conversation, you have a patient that's interested, or you have a clinician, so GP, uh, and that is really looking at how do you do this effectively and who could be a good candidate for this. They have an excellent algorithm that actually talks them through that overall process. So I'm not overly concerned about long-term adverse effects for some of these patients, but my pr primary concern is polypharmacy and confusion for those patients. So if we can reduce that burden and reduce that pill burden for patients, it can make a huge difference as well. I think that kind of addresses, I was scrolling down and looking at somebody was talking about the idea of People who come to us already predisposed to say, you know, th this is what the doctor told me that I should be taking, and maybe it's not necessary. Are there any things that you can give as advice, Michael, for how to kind of coach patients in the right direction in the dynamic of building rapport and trust uh, among our patients in terms of the deferral to the GP of my doctor says that I should be on this and we, and we have some concern about whether or not it's appropriate and how we approach uh, kind of navigating that space. So the biggest problem that we see within health translation or knowledge translation between interprofessionals, so between GPs and pharmacists is we're relying on the patient to actually share that information. So I do a lot of physician education. And one of the things that every time I did it, it was like I had a bullseye on my back where somebody would come up from the GP standpoint and said, you won't believe Mike, what the pharmacist in my region actually told my patient. I showed you in terms of the data that most patients actually don't remember what you told them and 50% of the information they told you was incorrect. So and they go back to the GP and say, my pharmacist told me this or the flip side, my GP told me this and you're thinking that just doesn't make any sense. Something doesn't seem to be right. The key thing here is instead of saying, your GP doesn't know what they're doing, or the pharmacist doesn't know what they're doing, is how do we work together and collaborate with that clinician? So if I had, you know, the pleasure of working in the same area as Professor Hunchin is coming up and saying, you know what, giving him a call and saying, I have this person here, this is the symptoms that they're having, I'm really kind of a little bit concerned about this. I know here in Canada, we live by the facts, so we still end up having that, but that communication is tend to improving. And with the GPs within our area, we are actually able to communicate because of the relationships I have by text, by email, just to, to have that component to make sure that that's better communicated. The fundamental issue here is to make sure that your patients truly understand what's happening. And, and I think that better interprofessional collaboration between GP specialists and pharmacists can lead to better overall outcomes for their patients. Yeah, I'd go a step further. I think Michael's absolutely right. But I think pharmacists do have a, uh, a well, an, ex an excellent knowledge of therapeutics. And I think, frankly, um, in any primary care setting, the pharmacist in a, is in a position to make sure that uh, drugs are not being prescribed in a way that causes interactions, that they're not being prescribed when they're no longer needed, um, and that uh, the patient understands, as you said, Michael, uh, you know, why they're on something and for how long and so forth. Um, and interprofessional collaboration is important, but equally, um, I would want my pharmacy colleagues to be able to stand up in their own right and question what might not be appropriate. This is such a, it's such a great point that we end up seeing here, and it's, it's a focus that we've had moving forward. I, as we mentioned that the health literacy is so poor, that's access to healthcare systems. So it's just think of in my area, we have a shortage of GPs has been a concern for a long period of time. Patients could have symptoms for months to years and self-treating with every home remedy under the sun before they're actually able to see someone. As we move to calmer ailments and minor ailments across the world, it allows us to actually help this patient to look at triaging that individual of who really needs to see Professor Hunjin and who can actually be managed with OTC PPI or PRN uh, H2 receptor blocker. And that allows us some flexibility to help those patients. Ruben, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, just, just a small example on, on this aspect of interprofessional collaboration, also the data, the data sharing systems that are not available in Portugal and Spain with GPs and pharmacists. But I had an example of someone that was taking a, a duplication of a PPI because the, the neighbor was taking something. And then I know it's not, in, it's not a majority, but sometimes you have this. Uh, she was taking, I think the prescription was omeprazole and she was taking pentaprazole on top of it because the, the neighbor said it was good for her. So if I had 
for example, a system where I could uh, write to my doctor, I can, of course, call or send an email, but the more practical system, I could say, okay, look, maybe this person has a duplication because there's an, uh, an informal or another way that she's getting this uh, medicine. So, um, yeah, j just to add to 10 cents to this conversation. Yeah, it's, it's the, in uh, I, I can I can speak to the Australian situation. Those, those systems are being built um, here as well. I mean, pharmacists don't have access to all of the functionality um, as yet, but it, but it's coming. But we also have um, a service called Home Medicine Reviews here, where the pharmacist is remunerated to go into the patient's home and look at the actual medicines that they are taking, <laughs> not not just the ones that uh, come through on the uh, report from the general practitioner uh, and then to provide a, a written report back to the uh, patient's general practitioner who has asked for the review um, and de-prescribing of PPI would be one of those things that would probably be top of mind um, in a lot of those reports and, and there's evidence mostly from hospital pharmacists but there's there are papers that have looked at the role of pharmacists in de-prescribing ppis and um they play they, they add a lot of value pharmacists add a lot of value in that process so it's uh, great for a multidisciplinary care perspective to be able to have a pharmacist and general practitioner talking to each other about this i think this is so much so as we just saw with the FIP presence at the WHA and advocacy at a global level, communicating the role of the pharmacist, the education that we have, our ability to advocate for ourselves and to and to show our value and our role in the team and, and what that integration looks like and how we can not step on one another's toes, but make sure that it's synergistic in our approach um, in terms of, thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Hunjin, about bringing the pharmacology and the and the pharmacokinetics and all of the things, the, the emphasis that we have on drugs in our education and bringing that as far as the management is concerned. Um, there was one other question. I just wanted to field it to everybody. Somebody was asking about uh, Bonozan, which is a another version that's available, is not approved here in the United States. Uh, it's only co-formulated with other antibiotics for use of H. pylori, and, but someone was asking about the role of Bonozan. Uh, so anybody in other parts of the world that have this drug that are have it approved? I think that's, a, that's quite an important question because um, I think um, Bonoprazan, which is a PCAP, of course, and that's a potassium competitive acid blocker, is a new range of drugs much more powerful than the proton pump inhibitors. And I can't help feeling that as it begins to hit pharmacies all around the world, particularly in those countries where you can um, use them over the counter or just uh, buy them directly, I think that this is going to present a new factor. Uh, if we're worried about uh, um, you know, the proton pump inhibitors being used primarily as the first step in people who present to pharmacies, don't forget, uh, Michael, you missed one point. Many patients have a uh, preconceived notion of what is good for them and what they want. You mentioned uh, that the pharmacist is possibly the third person the person consults, first a family member, secondly um, a friend, and then the pharmacist. And, um, and in that setting, most people, many in, across the world will go to pharmacists and say, can I have this particular PPI? I suspect we're about to reach the stage where people are going to say, can I have this particular PCAP, uh, a potassium competitive acid blocker like uh, Onoprazan? So I think it's something that our pharmacy colleagues need to be aware of. This is a, a new thing arriving. From my viewpoint as a clinician, I would say this is something that really needs to be prescribed with care uh, with careful clinical consideration. Um, we haven't yet got the guidelines for where it's uh, meant to be used. So this is just an early warning for colleagues across the world in the commercial sector. Would you agree with that? Coming down the pipeline. Yeah. I saw everybody else sort of shake their head so nobody else has encountered that in terms of their space. Okay. All right, so things to know. So PPRs, maybe not as bad as we thought they were. Watch out for this new class of drug coming down the pipeline. Um, 
I think that wraps up the rest of our questions. We have five minutes remaining, which I think times out very nicely. I want to thank so much all the panelists that were here uh, in the late night and the early mornings. Uh, it was very much appreciated. Sounds like everybody was felt very informative about it. Um, I learned some things and I work in this sphere. So thank you guys so much. I want to just uh, remind everyone that's on the call, registration is currently available. We're still in the early bird registration. So lower fees, make sure that you register for Congress. Um, FIP's 81st World Congress is going to be in Brisbane, Australia this year. Uh, the prices are set until June 15th, and then they will go up. So make sure that you navigate to brisbane2023.fip.org to register for Congress. Lots of exciting presentations going to be given there. And I wanted to make sure that I uh, give the opportunity to highlight um, our colleagues at the Pharmacy Education Journal and the things that they're doing. The Pharmacy Education Journal is a fully open access peer review journal that has been serving the domain of pharmacy education, workforce development, and associated fields for over 20 years. PEG, PEJ, sorry, is specifically supporting and encouraging early career pharmacists and scientists and practitioners to publish work with a no cost route to dissemination, particularly where scientific English is not the first language. So make sure that you navigate to FIP's website to find more about the Pharmacy Education Journal. Thank you all for being present for these webinars. All of our uh, future events can be found at events.fip.org. Please navigate there. And again, thank you all so much for coming. Much appreciated. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Good night.